welcome to SpyCast, the official podcast of the International Spy Museum. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Hammond, the museum's historian and curator. Every week, we explore some aspect of the past, present, or future of intelligence and espionage. Please subscribe to the show if you haven't already, and consider leaving us a five-star review so other listeners can find us. Coming up next on SpyCast. They felt that this is the language that was given to them by the holy people, and it's a language that could be used in the military, which they did. The story of the Navajo Code Talkers of World War II is one of the most fascinating in the history of secret communications. In effect, Native American peoples sent their languages into battle on behalf of the United States. The irony, as this week's guest points out, is that Uncle Sam had already done so much to undermine and marginalise these languages before the war. This week's episode features the daughter of a Code Talker, Poet Laurie of the Navajo Nation, and author of the book Code Talker Stories, Laura Tohey. In this week's episode, Laura and I discuss how the code talking units were formed, how the Navajo people used their language as a weapon, Laura's father, Benson Tohey's story, and the intriguing question, did the Japanese ever break the code? We also discuss the Navajo Nation, which is the largest Native American reservation in the United States, straddling four states in the American Southwest. The original podcast on intelligence since 2006, we are SpyCast. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Well, thanks so much for joining me to speak about your father, Laura. I'm very pleased to speak to you. Happy to be here. I talked about the Navajo Code Talkers. I wonder if it would be all right if I introduce myself in the Navajo language. Yes, please. Yeah, that would be great. This will give the listeners a chance to hear what the language sounds like and how the uh, code talkers took this language and developed it into a code. So I'll say it in Navajo first, and then I'll translate it into English. The English translation is, Hello, I am called Laura Tohi. I am Sleepy Rock People Clan, born for the Bitter Water Clan people. My maternal grandfather clone are the Sun Clan people from Laguna Pueblo, and my Colonel Grandfather Clone are the Coyote Pass people. My father's name was Benson Tohi. He served in World War II as a Navajo code talker. And that is how I define myself. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for doing that. So your father was one of the celebrated Navajo code talkers. When do you first recall hearing about this story? You know, I went to visit my father in 1983. I was living in the Midwest at the time. And uh, when I went to visit him, he said he had just come back from Washington, D.C., where he and some of the other co-talkers had been honored. He said he had been in a parade. And then he showed me the silver medal he brought out. And so this is what I got. He didn't really say who honored him, and he didn't really talk a lot about going there and why he was there. And that was sort of the way that he created the whole topic of his service. He never talked about it. To me, he mentioned, you know, that he had been in the service and he had been in the South Pacific and he had been in China. But as far as actually talking about him being a co talker and what he did and where he uh, was said, he was not specific about it. So I didn't find out until 1983 that um, he had been honored for his military service. And I thought that's what it was about. 
But later on, uh, when I was um, teaching at the university, one of my students did a research project on the Navajo Code Talkers. And it was actually from that student that I learned more about who the Code Talkers were. And then I started to put things together because when I was a child growing up with my parents, we used to go to these parades in Gallup, New Mexico, and the Code Talkers used to march in there. And I'd see them and I didn't know what they did or who they were. They just had this slide that said Navajo Code Talkers. My father didn't participate in that. So I, you know, it was all these pieces that were out there. And then finally, after my student gave this research talk, I learned what my father had done and what his service was. But I, unfortunately, I didn't get to talk to him more about it when I wrote this book on the co-talkers. He had already passed by then. So that's kind of my story with my father's service. How long was he in the military for? Was it for the duration of the war or did he have a career in the military or serve another few years? No, my father um, enlisted when he was actually 16 years old and he was underage to do that. But he got his parents to sign the papers that allowed him to enlist. And he said on that paper that he was actually 17 when he was actually 16 years old. So he went in uh, 1944 and he was discharged in 1945. And my father passed in um, 1994. So he, like I mentioned, he um, rarely spoke of his service, but he did tell us some of the stories about being in China. Before we go on to discuss the Code Talkers a little bit more, I'm just interested to learn a little bit more about your father. Could you tell us a little bit more about his story, his his upbringing, um, what kind of man he was and so forth? Okay, yeah, my father's name was Benson Tohi. He uh, grew up at Coyote Canyon, New Mexico, which is on the Navajo Nation homeland. But he went to college after he was discharged to study bookkeeping. And he was there maybe a year or two when his father asked him to come home because he had started a coal mining business and he wanted my father to help him. So my father dropped out of school and went home and worked on the Toki coal mine business, which is what it was called. At the time, my father's father, my grandfather, delivered coal from this coal mine business that he owned, he would deliver coal to the schools on the Navajo Nation because that's how they got their energy. And he became wealthy from that. Uh, There was a time when they had a lot of cattle and horses in Hollywood. Um, When they would come out to the reservation, they used to sometimes... Um, borrow or rent my family's horses to be used in these films. So he, you know, was a part of that business until it closed. And then later on, my father became a welder. And um, he was also a rancher because my family had livestock. We had horses and cows that the whole family owned. And my father helped to take care of that. Uh, My father was also a cowboy. He rode Saddle Brock in the rodeos and won a few times. Oh, wow. Yeah. Have you seen Yellowstone? Yes, I have. I, yeah. yeah I mean, it's, a, it's a pretty extreme sport, but he, he liked that. And later on, he was inducted into the All Indian Rodeo Cowboy Association. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And later on in his later years, he became a sheep herder. He stayed home and took care of the sheep and uh, was also a great lover of hats. He had all kinds of hats that he liked to have as part of his photo. Wow. <laughs> what, what, what a fascinating uh, man your father was. Yes. And <laughs> I forgot to mention that he ran away from 
um, school, I think when he was probably still in junior high, in the middle school years, he didn't like the parochial school that he was in. He said the nuns made him walk on his knees from the entrance of the church to the altar. And he just said, really? yeah, he said he just got tired of that. He just didn't take it anymore. So he told his friend he was going to run away. And his friend said, I'll go with you. And so they did. They ran away. And from Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is where he was at school, to his home, it's probably 350, maybe 400 miles away. And I don't know how far he hitchhiked or how far he walked, but he did make it all the way home. And his parents... Um, Put him into another school, which he liked better. And and you mentioned the Navajo Nation just previously there. And the Navajo Nation, can you just tell our listeners a little bit more about that? As as I understand it, it's the the largest uh, reservation in the country. Is that correct? Yes. Um, it's about the size of the state of West Virginia. Uh, for those Americans that would know, or whoever's listening. It's quite large. It extends into part of New Mexico, Arizona, and a little bit into southern Utah. And um, our reservation um, land was actually a lot larger. Um, after the Navajo people were released from captivity in 1868, they went back to their homes and this reservation boundary was set up. And so that's the, the reservation today. But originally our homeland was within the boundaries of what we call the four sacred mountains. And each of the mountains uh, is sits at a cardinal position. So there's east, southwest, and the north mountains. And that land within that area was originally our homeland. We have also um, a Quite a large number in our population, over 350,000. Uh, a lot of the um, Navajo people live in urban areas or off the reservation homeland, and some live on the homeland. Uh, the homeland is just like everywhere else. We have schools, hospitals. We have our own uh, capital uh, government. We have museums, uh, businesses. Not a lot of businesses, but nevertheless, you know, we are trying to build up our our nation as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the four sacred peaks. Where are they, Laura? Um, there's the East Mountain is in um, Colorado. And then there's uh, one in New Mexico, one in Arizona, and one in, in uh, another one in Colorado. So there's four, and um, those names are very, they're, in, they're Navajo names, but we just call them by their American col colonial names. Um, those mountains to the Navajo people and to some of the tribes that are near there consider these mountains to be sacred, and the mountains are protectors and guides for many of the indigenous peoples. So where the Navajo Nation is now, it's relatively close to the traditional home between the four sacred peaks, is that correct? Yes. Um, there, like For example, I live in Phoenix, and one of the mountains is north of here, just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. From here, it's probably a two-hour drive. And let's move on to talk a little bit more about the Code Talker. So help our listeners understand, for those that don't know what they are, what is a Code Talker? The Code Talkers um, were a select group of, in this case, the Navajo were Marines who enlisted just after Pearl Harbor was bombed. And at that time, the military, specifically the Marines, were in desperate need of a code that could be used to send over the radio waves because the Japanese were deciphering all the uh, codes that were being sent over the radio. Well, there were a group of 
young Navajo men that enlisted after the bombing, they were sent to San Diego and they were selected based on their fluency in Navajo and English. Well, just prior to that, there was a man named Philip Johnson who had served in World War I and he had been raised on the Navajo Nation homeland. His parents worked there and it said that he could speak Navajo. So he brought this idea forward to the Marines to use the Navajo language as a code because he had heard about Choctaws using their language uh, in Germany. And so the Marines listened to this idea and um, they decided to test it out. So these young men, when they enlisted, they got to Camp Elliott, north of, or just near San Diego. They were selected out and they were put in two, uh, two rooms. And they were asked to send messages back and forth in Navajo and English. And each time the language was used and also translated into English. The messages came back very quick and it was accurate. And so from that point on, the Marines decided to go ahead and develop this code. So these young men were tasked with um, coming up with a secret code. They were all Navajos. There were other tribes that also served as code talkers. So these young men then developed this code over the course of very few months and made it ready to be used in the South Pacific where they were sent. So these young men used the Navajo language to send messages, secret messages over the radio waves in the South Pacific and many of the islands where they were stationed. Um, the Japanese could not decipher these um, messages. They tried, and it wasn't until towards the end of the war that they realized that it was a Native American language. So you mentioned these young men. Would all of them have spoken Navajo? Would they all have spoken a Navajo in English? You know, so I come from Scotland and Gaelic is one of the, the uh, native languages, but it's not spoken very widely by a lot of people. So I'm just trying to get an understanding of how common it was for, for these young men or men of that age to speak both English and Navajo. Was that completely normal or was that a minority? At the time when the code talkers enlisted, it was normal. Everyone spoke Navajo. Overall, though, there were a lot of Navajo speakers only. Some from that generation did not speak English. The ones that went to the residential schools on the homeland or outside of the homeland were sent to these schools to assimilate them which meant to take away indigenous identity and especially the language to make over the Native American into white society's image that they wanted. And so when they got to these schools, these young children were not allowed to speak their own native language. That was the case for me when I first entered a day school, which is like a boarding school, but I didn't live on campus, I walked from home. We were not allowed to speak our language in the school. We were punished for it. Punishment consisted of slapping our hands with the ruler by the teacher. Sometimes we had to stand in the corner facing the wall. And there were extreme cases where children were um, punished by having their mouths washed out with soap. And this was to make sure that they would not speak the language. That was that generation when everyone spoke Navajo on the, on the Navajo Nation homeland. Today, it's quite different as a result of these boarding schools. So when these young men got into the military, they were uh, fluent in Navajo and being that they had been in school, they could speak English. And that was one of the requirements uh, for them to become a code talker. In this interlude, I just want to briefly discuss the broader context of the code talkers. 
In World War I, the Choctaw Code Talkers pioneered utilising their native language on the battlefield as a means of secure communications. Indigenous languages functioned as a code that Germans could not understand, and at the time, these languages were largely oral. They were wrapped up, however, in another layer of security, because the soldiers had to come up with terms for battlefield technologies, such as bad air for gas, scalps for casualties, and little gun fast shoot for a machine gun. From the Comanche code talkers on the beaches at Normandy with the US Army, through to the Navajo code talkers at Iwo Jima with the US Marines in World War II, Native Americans have displayed unwavering courage and patriotism in defense of the United States of America. It's obviously very different, but again, I'm just thinking of Scotland, where I am from, and uh, there was one point in time when you were persecuted if you spoke Gaelic and uh, if you wore a kilt that many people around the world will know of Scottish men wearing. Uh, those were persecuted as well. So it's kind of interesting the way that governments can relate to language. So there's a great question here that Erin, who works on the podcast with me, um, thought up. So she's saying the relationship between the US government and the Navajo language is, is really interesting because on the one hand, native speakers like you were punished for speaking the language and you were encouraged to speak English. But then the government used that very same language and its speakers for their benefit during the war. Uh, and her question is, how did code f talkers feel about this relationship between their language and Uncle Sam? They were astounded when they got into the service and they were told, now you're going to use your language to develop a code. They said, but back at home, they told us not to speak Navajo, and now they want us to develop a code in Navajo. So they were not only astounded, they were puzzled why they would be asked to do this when they were in a, in a school where they were, their identity was trying to be, their identity was being erased uh, for going to, for being a Navajo person. So yeah, they got over that and, um, they quickly put this code together, despite the treatment they had received from the U.S., you know, being incarcerated for four years from 1864 to 1868, and then being put in these residential boarding schools where they were, their identity was being erased. That was one of the things that I found very interesting, what they felt that they wanted to do something for the nation, not just the Navajo Nation, but they were interested in preserving and helping the U.S. government in this war effort. And so the language then became a weapon that they used as part of their fighting. So they talked about, when I interviewed, Twenty of the last remaining code talkers for the book I wrote. We talked about the language and how powerful it is, and they felt that this is the language that was given to them by the holy people, and it's a language that could be used in the military, which they did. So I think that um, they always felt very grateful that they knew the map language and were able to use it during the war to help save America. And it also helped save many American lives as well. So basically the Navajo language went to war in World War II? Yes, it was a weapon. That's what they called it. Just out of interest, Laura, how difficult is uh, Navajo to learn um, as a, you know, on a, a scale of one to <laughs> ten? Is it, is it quite easy? Is it super difficult? Help us understand the language a little bit more. Well, Navajo was my first language, and I also learned English at home because both of my parents spoke both languages fluently. I have heard that it's very difficult because, for one thing, it's not a romance language. 
the pronunciation is difficult to learn. I think you have to learn that those pronunciations of how to use your tongue and the air to make words. So it's difficult for, I think, for non Navajo speakers or even some Navajos that haven't learned the language to speak the language because it's it's a difficult language I understand. But for some of the outsiders that came to the Navajo Nation, for example, traders and early missionaries, some of them were able to learn the language and speak it. And the early Catholics who came to the Holy Land did some of the early language work with the Navajo language. It was not a written language until later. There is now two Navajo language dictionaries. The Bible has been translated into Navajo. This was all after World War II? Yes. It was, okay. I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of Navajo. How many uh, Navajo speakers are there now? I know that a number of... Native American languages, the, the number of speakers has declined since the war. Is that also the case with Navajo? Yes. Many indigenous languages in this country and Canada have declined as a result of the residential schools that were built during the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, UNESCO has designated the Navajo language as vulnerable. There's a estimate of there are maybe 150,000 Navajo speakers. Of that number, most of them are probably an older generation. The younger generation um, don't speak Navajo. They speak mainly English now. During the pandemic, we lost a lot of older people who knew the language and Navajo culture. So our language has probably diminished a bit more because of COVID. Yeah, I can see that um, because it disproportionately affected uh, the elderly. Yes. And the other thing, too, is that during um, the time when my parents and my generation went to these residential schools and received this harsh treatment for speaking Navajo, Parents didn't teach their children Navajo because they were afraid that it would hold them back or they would receive the same kind of punishment that they received in these schools. So as a result, they didn't teach the younger, their children, uh, the language. So that's another reason our language has diminished a great deal. There's no word in English for tank until the invention of the tank. So in Navajo, there's no word for tank. So when they come up with a code, they have to come up with a, a code word for tank, a code word for submarine, uh, a code word for ship, etc. So could you give us a couple of examples of the code? Yes, um, there are over 440 code words that were created. Uh, and all of these words had to be committed to memory. They could not use notes in the field. Everything was in their, own, in their memories. And they talked about when I interviewed the code talkers, they talked about having to periodically practice um, the code. And also they added new words as they were in, in the war, which I thought was really unique because the Navajos during that time period used their memories to think a lot more than we do today. You know, now we can write notes down and put it in our phone or our computers or a date book or something. But back then, people didn't do that. They had to memorize everything orally. Because we have a very rich oral tradition in which stories have to be memorized, songs, prayers that were used in sacred ceremonies have to be memorized. So our memories, I think, Back then, I know it was true for my mother. She could remember a lot more than I do. I'm kind of one of these people now that have to write things down. But they were uniquely prepared, I think, for that reason, that they were able to call on the oral tradition of the Navajo people to memorize these words. The words that they came up with um, were related to animals and insects and things in the house. Uh, the alphabet, they used the English alphabet from A to Z. They had 
like for for example, for A, the letter A, they have three different words. Uh, same thing with B, C, and for most of the alphabet, there were three words. So they could anytime interchange um, that word as they were sending the code. So it would be harder for the for it to be de decoded. They also had to come up with place names, like for example, Suribachi. We don't have that word in the Navajo language, so they would have to spell it out or they use a shortcut word for that. They also used uh, animals for some of the artillery, like for example, a battleship became an iron fish, which uh, we call, now we call it fish, just means iron fish. So if they were using that word in the transmission, that's what they would say. They wouldn't spell out every letter in that word. And my favorite one is uh, grenade, which they use potato. Potato. And yes, we have a word in Navajo, namasi. So a potato, you can hold your hand and you can throw it, it's like a grenade. So I thought it was very ingenious that they use, and they use a lot of animals. Like, for example, fighter bomber was a hummingbird. We have a word for that. Uh, also, observation plane became an owl because uh, it you know, sits, makes sense. Yes, it observes things. Uh, eggs were, um, they were, bombs were called eggs. And, um, you know, things like um, submarine or battleship, those are words that were not part of our language, so they had to think of animals that behave like some of this artillery, and they, then they were able to create a word for that. Uh, it's, re it's really, really fascinating. And can you tell me how the Code Talker teams functioned? So, for example, was each individual Code Talker, so to speak? So they would be on a radio, they would listen to a message, they would then uh, take the message to an officer or, or an NCO, uh, or was it there were like teams, so there would be two of them that would be together to do it, or three of them together to do it. Like, it just help me understand how it all functioned. Yeah, most of the time they worked in pairs of two. Okay, one to send and one to receive? Yes, and then there would be another pair that the messages would be sent to or from. So the code talker would be given a message in English to encode. Then he would write that message down, and then that message would be sent over the radio waves to another set of code talkers who then translated the messages into English, and then they pass that message on to whoever it was intended for. Everything that was sent over the radio waves was in Navajo using this code that they developed. Sometimes they delivered messages on foot. Um, they also didn't always like to go alone on foot because they were afraid that they would get taken by the Americans and, you know, arrested and maybe they thought they might be Japanese. So they didn't like to go alone. They would rather go with a white soldier who could, you know, get them through wherever they needed to go. So everything had to be um, done very quickly because in a war time, time is of the essence. The code worked beyond expectation is what one of the code talkers told me. Um, it was a mess, they were messages that were very specific only to Navajo people. And these words that were used um, could be easily set over the radio waves without the Japanese ever deciphering it. By the end of the war, they had, like I said, over 442 words. Some of the words were added during um, the war time. Uh, they also had to use shortcut words like for names of officers, military organizations, countries, and months. 
So rather than spelling out a word, say like um, destroyer, they had the shortcut word for that. They could just send that out rather than spending time spelling it all out. But if they didn't have a code word for artillery, then they would rely on the alphabet to spell it out. So they would translate it into the native alphabet and then relay it over the radio? Well, they would uh, translate it into English for okay. when they receive the message. And um, just out of interest, did the Japanese, as far as we know, did they ever cotton on to this? Did they know that this was happening? They did towards the end of the war. They realized it was a Native American language. There was a story about a man who was in the Bataan Death March. He survived and he came back. And he said that while he was there, the Japanese made him listen to these messages the Navajo code talkers were sending. And he kept telling the Japanese, I, I can speak Navajo, but I don't know the code. I'm not a code talker. I don't know what they're saying. And they made him listen to the messages and he would pick out words here and there and tell the Japanese. But he said the Japanese tortured him. And finally they let him go. So he made it back to the U.S. He was discharged and he went to the co-talkers and he kind of joked with them. And he said, it was because of you guys I was tortured. And um, he said, but I, you know, I, I survived, so I'm okay. Um, but that was just one of the stories I heard about. It's incredible. And were there any, I mean, I'm sure there were many, but is there a particular battle that you would refer to to demonstrate to our listeners the, the Code Talkers in action? Maybe there's some famous battle or, or one where the Code Talkers were utilized or something. I'm just trying to give our audience something concrete to to hang their hats on to think about. Right. Well, they fought only in the South Pacific. They did not go to Europe. So they went to many of the islands in the South Pacific. Um, some of the major battles that they fought in were places like Tienan. Was it Iwo, Iwo Jima one of them? Yes, Iwo Jima. They went to Guadalcanal. Bougainville, Peleli, Guam, Okinawa. Um, they went to a lot of the places in the South Pacific. They did go to uh, Iwo Jima. Some of the co talkers that were there uh, witnessed the raising of the flag. And um, they also talked about what it was like to land on those islands where many Americans were killed. Uh, that was one of the things I was a little bit leery of asking too much about because these are male stories. Well, they were forthcoming in telling me many of the places that they fought in, and some of them had to live in foxholes for week, days at a time before they were able to get out of there. So they also fought in Guam, um, Bougainville. And my father um, was wounded. He ended up in Peking, which is now Beijing. He recuperated there in China. How and why he got there, I don't know. Or if he was sent to Peking just to recuperate. I don't know if he fought there or not, because as, as I said, my father didn't talk much about his service. Hi, my name is Hannah Saloyo. I am lucky enough to work on both our exhibits and programs team here at the museum, bringing all of our wonderful content to life, whether that's through an exhibit or through a program. And one of my favorite moments here at the museum happened during our 2019 gala to celebrate the opening of our new building and new museum. And I was with my mom and dad. They were flew out from um, back home and we're walking through the fifth floor galleries and we get to the codes gallery. And there's a small section on code talking there. And my mom turns to me and says, did you know a extended family member was a code talker? And I looked at her and said, what, what are you talking about? How did you not mention this to me 
before I got this job during the interview process like a year ago. And she's like, oh, maybe I, I thought I had. Um, so to put a little context on that, my, uh, I am a member of the Hopi tribe. My mother was born on the reservation. My grandmother was born and raised on the reservation. And it was really exciting when I came to work here. Uh, I was going through the content of what we we're putting in the new museum, and there was a section on code talking, and I was very excited to see that. Little did I know I had this connection to a fam an extended family member. Um, I am now digging more into who this person was, what they did. It's my understanding that he worked in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Um, and it's funny because it ties back kind of also to why the first, when I moved to D.C., I'm originally from New Mexico. I moved here to be an intern at the American Indian Museum. And, you know, years down the line, over a decade later, here I am at SPY using my backroom from both being Native, working at American Indian, and now getting to research amazing intelligence stories that hopefully in the future we can develop more on the Code Talking programs. How many Navajo code talkers were trained during the war? Well, there's been some information that's not accurate uh, that we found out recently in, in researching how many Navajo code talkers there were. We think that there were at least 432 who served. During the war, Records were kept on paper so they could be either lost or misplaced or wrong information sometimes was closed on there. So they could be also inaccurate. But we think there was at least 432 Navajo code talkers that served during World War II. And of that, uh, the original code talkers, there may have been as many as 32 or 34 original code talkers who developed the code and then taught the next group of code talkers. My father was in the, the later group of code talkers. Um, they worked, uh, like I mentioned, they worked very hard in getting this code together so that they could be sent out to the military and then to have it taught to the next group of code talkers. It's, it's really an incredible story. How, how many of the code talkers uh, were lost in action? As far as I know, what I found that there were at least three KIA killed in action. Uh, there may have been more. I do know one of the things that the code talkers said that they had bodyguards. The bodyguards' role was to protect the code talkers. In the event the code talker was captured, the bodyguard was to shoot the code talker. That's how. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's how much the code had to be protected. Now I never heard from any of the code talkers that I interviewed if that ever happened or not. But some of them did mention that they knew they had a bodyguard. Some said, "If I had one, I didn't know it." So I I got various stories on the bodyguard. In the Navajo Nation, is there a memorial to the Code Talkers or a museum? Yes. Um, on the Navajo Nation capital, which is in Window Rock, Arizona, there is a veterans park and a Code Talkers statue. And below the statue are the names of all the Code Talkers who served, including my father's. And in that same park are all the names of other Navajo veterans who fought in other wars. On August 14th, which is Navajo Code Talker Day, uh, it was proclaimed by President Ronald Reagan. And that was the day that we now celebrate the Navajo Code Talkers. And in Window Rock, um, there is lots of people come to celebrate this day, families, descendants, uh, there are a lot of speeches and speakers, and there's a barbecue, and it's just a day of celebrating the code talkers. They come from 
we think, well, actually, we think there's probably only three co-talkers left. All the original original co-talkers lost. But we think there are three co-talkers left today. So there is a celebration that the Navajo Nation um, uh, celebrates and honors the co-talkers. And then there's a national Navajo co-talk bill on August 14th. And in Phoenix, um, where I went to downtown a few weeks ago on August 14th, I um, was able to see the Navajo Kotaka statue there as well. And can you tell us a little bit more about your book, Laura? I think that's really fascinating. Can you tell us just a little bit more about it, who you interviewed, some of the main things that you discovered along the way? Yeah, the name of my book is Kotaka Stories. It's an oral history book in which I interviewed 20 of the last living code talkers at that time and some of their descendants. I worked with a photographer, Deborah O'Grady, who took the photographs and the portraits for the book. We traveled to many of the code talker meetings when they were still being held in Gallup, New Mexico and got the permission of the co-talkers to come out to their home or to meet them at a particular place to interview them. Most of the co-talkers were forthcoming and willing to uh, be interviewed, some not so much, so I left them alone. I had more maps written on napkins and scrap paper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Give me the directions to their house and the directions would be like, just go down the highway from Crown Point, go north towards Chuckle Canyon. And then when you get to the road where you'll see a tire uh, hanging on a fence, turn right there and then go about a mile and you'll see some cattle or sheep camp there. <laughs> it was, and I grew up on the red, so I know what that's like to tell directions by visual objects rather than by highway names and so forth. So we would travel all around from, from New Mexico and Arizona and Southern Utah uh, looking for the co-talkers who wanted to be interviewed. So I started in 2008 and finished the project in 2011. It was fascinating to hear their stories and what they did before, during, and after the war. I was able to find out more about what my father did and what war was, must have been like for him from listening to their stories. There, the book didn't include him, but I did write a small essay on him and his love of hats. So this, <laughs> yeah, he was a big lover of hats. He had um, welder's hats and cowboy hats. And uh, so it was a fun project to do. I got to hear the stories of these remarkable Navajo men who gave their lives, you know, when they signed up, when they enlisted in the military and they were willing to lay down their lives for this country. And that was, I found that to be remarkable and very heroic. And just, you know, something that a nation contributed and gave to this country. So that was really um, a very positive experience for me. And the book is written in Navajo and English. Some of the code talkers spoke in Navajo, some in English and some in both languages. Everything was recorded. And my son helped work on the transcription of that. I also had all the Navajo translated into English. So anyone that picks up this book would be able to read the language. I was also interested in having a story of our people for the next generation that could read about what you know, the Navajo co-talkers did or what their grandfather or great-grandfather did and how the language was used. 
So that was really important for me and the publisher that I worked with was very open to that. And it was a, it was a, it was a most fun research project I ever did. I got to travel all around uh, the res, as we call it for short, the reservation, and just listen to stories, very interesting stories. And when I first started the project, I asked them questions like, how long were you in the military? And what did you do? And, you know, questions like that that could be answered with a yes or no or a short sentence. And it wasn't getting anywhere. So I, I knew I had to change the way I asked them for their stories. I just asked them, can you tell me a story about being a code talker? And that's all I said. And then out comes this flooding of stories about where they grew up and the things they did and their families and what they learned in school and their military life and what they did during the war and after they came back. It was quite interesting. I just spent two days listening to one co-talker who was so interesting. And one of the things that he told me that I didn't know is that he said he had to deliver ammunition on a surfboard from the ships to land. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's some one story I had never heard. So I, you know, my whole life was enriched by what they told me. I feel so honored that they gave me their stories that I was able to write a book and to be interviewed on on spy museum so that everyone else would know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Can you tell me a story about researching the Code Talkers? Was there, was there anything that was particularly um, unusual, fascinating, memorable, humorous, dramatic? I'm sure there were many, but maybe if you could share one with our listeners. Yeah, um, I think one of the things that I learned overall was the humility that the Code Talkers exhibited when I spoke to them you know if with Navajo people we don't like to put ourselves out there and brag about ourselves and you know say the things we've accomplished and so forth that's kind of low-key you know you let someone else do that for you yeah humility is not really in fashion anymore (laughs) I know know, it's not (laughs) but yeah with them especially with social media so that was one of the things that I was very taken by and I know that's the way I grew up we were told not to boast about yourself and the code talkers didn't boast about themselves they just said this is what I did and sometimes if a family member was there they would interject and for the code talker and say well he did this and he did that it was kind of like building the the grandfather or the the father up Um, so I was able to get those kind of stories as well and it was really quite an experience to be part of this historic project, to have it written so that other people would be able to know who we are. Because so much of our presence and our history in the United States and in the world is we're, we're invisible. You know, we don't know, people don't know a lot about us other than maybe stereotypes or something from Hollywood movies. But this is something that they did because they felt it was their duty. They felt it was their responsibility to help protect the land. Uh, One thing that I did find something interesting, too, is that some of the co-talkers said that when the recruiter came to their high school to give this talk about losing them, they said the recruiter was dressed up in their uniform. And they said, they look, he looked really sharp. He said, and I wanted to look like him. So I enlisted. So the, even the, the uniform became something that they were, um, that was a way, a means for them to enlist. And like many um, veterans, because of the poverty on the reservation during that time, as there still is today, they used, um, the money that they received in the military sent home to help their family. Um, one of the other stories that the code talkers told me was that 
he, this is called Parker, Mr. So, Samuel So, the one I spent two, uh, two days talking to and listening to his stories. He said that he received a letter from the local veterans office one day asking him to come down because there was a mail for him. So he went there, picked it up, and it was a letter that arrived 50 years later from his, hey, wow. yeah, from his mother. She had gotten someone to write a letter to him and sent it over to him while he was serving. And never, he never received it until he got back 50 years later. Wow. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. Yes, it really was. And that Mr. So was the best storyteller. I mean, I could still be listening to him today. <laughs> he had so much to say and so interesting. And I think that was the other beautiful part of doing this project is the Code Talkers had, are so resourceful in knowing you know, this military history, but also knowing all uh, the cultural history of the Navajo people. And I just feel so lucky and grateful that I was trusted with that. Wow, th th this is also fascinating. Now I really want to go to Window Rock uh, and see, see the memorial. Thanks ever so much for your time. This has been really uh, incredible. Uh, and I think that one of the things about the research that you've done is that, you know, this this lives on now. It doesn't just die when the code talkers die. It lives on in your book or even in the podcast. Thanks so much for your time. This has been a pleasure. For me too. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of SpyCast. Please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have feedback, you can reach us by email at spycast.spymuseum.org or on Twitter at INTL SpyCast. If you go to our page at thecyberwire.com forward slash podcast forward slash SpyCast, you can find links to further resources, detailed show notes, and full transcripts. I'm your host, Andrew Hammond, and my podcast content partner is Erin Dietrich. The rest of the team involved in the show is Mike Mincy, Memphis Vaughn III, Emily Coletta, Emily Renz, Afu Anokwa, Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, and Jen Iben. This show is brought to you from the home of the world's preeminent collection of intelligence and espionage-related artifacts, the International Spy Museum. Spy Museum.